So before we get started, uh, I first want to acknowledge and celebrate the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples on whose unceded lands the Australian National University is built and upon which we meet today. I pay my respect to elders past and present and extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people here today. And as this is a hybrid seminar, I wish to acknowledge that we have participants joining us from outside of Canberra, and therefore any participants on Zoom are invited to add your own acknowledgements and country to the chat. So it is my great pleasure to welcome you to this seminar in the Deep Conversations series, a collaboration between the ANU Centres for Environmental History and Laureate Research Centre for Deep History. The purpose of today's seminar is to discuss the rise of digital mapping as both a tool for historical research and as a form of, of public communication uh, for, for historians and humanities scholars. And to do this, we're lucky to be joined by four scholars who have been involved in some of the best known mapping projects in Australia and who are currently involved in a range of extremely exciting projects. Mike Jones is a postdoctoral research fellow in the Research Centre for Deep History here at ANU. We'll be discussing the centre's ongoing marking country project, which aims to develop a deeper understanding of Australia's pre-1788 history, transforming the scale and scope of history through the analysis of Australia's epic Indigenous narratives, alongside relevant new scientific evidence, creating new approaches to the history of greater Australia. Tim Morgan is a PhD student at the ANU and a librarian at the National Library of Australia. Uh, and she'll be discussing the current research project on the application of digital mapping software to the analysis of 19th century Australian fiction. Uh, Emma Thomas, who is on Zoom, uh, is a postdoctoral fellow at the Laureate Centre for History and Population at the University of New South Wales. The current book project analyzes the intersections of gender and sexuality, labour regimes, demographic crisis, and, and colonial violence in Papua New Guinea under German rule. And she'll be talking to us today about her collaboration with Associate Professor Emma Christopher uh, on the project Mapping Histories of Blackbirding in the Pacific Labor Trade. Uh, and Bill Pascoe, who is a digital humanities specialist and currently the system architect on Time Layered Cultural Map, National Digital Humanities Mapping Infrastructure Project. He has wide experience across a range of digital humanities projects, including with the Colonial Frontier Massacres Project at the University of Newcastle. Uh, how the seminar will go from here is I'm going to hand over to each of our presenters in turn. We will give an overview of their projects for roughly 10 to 15 minutes, more likely 15, I think I can confidently say. <laughs> uh, and then I'm just going to ask a few questions of our panel uh, to reflect on sort of the skills, the questions, the research processes, and some of the ethical considerations that underpin their work. Uh, and then we'll open the floor and Zoom room to questions. Uh, and with that, I will hand over to Mike to kick us off. Thank you. I'm just going to share my screen. Okay. Uh, thank you, Rowan. Uh, thanks for having me along for this session today. Uh, I'd also like to acknowledge that I'm speaking from the unceded lands of the Nunawal and Nambri peoples and pay my respects to elders past and present. I welcome any First Nations people joining us in the session today. So I'm the Deputy Director of the Research Centre for Deep History uh, here at the School of History at ANU. And the Research Centre was launched on 30th of October 2019. Uh, it emerged out of the Kathleen Fitzpatrick Laureate Program, Rediscovering the Deep Human Past, Global Networks, Future Opportunities. So that's a five-year Laureate Program that uh, runs until February next year, February 2023. Uh, I joined the Laureate a couple of years in, and and ANU uh, in July 2019. Uh, and I came to this project with a background as an archivist, a collections consultant, and a historian. Uh, and I both worked on and led a number of uh, digital humanities and digital public history projects uh, at primarily the University of Melbourne uh, with a bunch of collaborators. So I was kind of brought onto the project uh, in some ways uh, due to that expertise as much as my expertise as a historian. Uh, because there were uh, conversations in the Laureate and in the Research Centre about the idea of developing an interactive digital atlas that could tell us more about the, the deep history of the Australian continent. Uh, the ideas behind this was that this would uh, sort of speak back to uh, and counter the kind of uh, 
long-standing understanding that people have of the way that the continent has been mapped that comes through a very kind of European perspective of mapping. Uh, so this kind of perspective, uh, this is uh, Thevenot's map from uh, the late 17th century or mid 17th century, the first known European map produced that was devoted entirely to the Australian continent. And this shows European knowledge of that region in 1644 uh, with the northern, western and some of the southern coastlines uh, as explored by the Dutch. Uh, this was taken over by colonial maps like Stanford's new map of Australia from 1864. Uh, this has the sort of familiar state and territory boundaries uh, emerging. It also maps colonial infrastructures and the pathways of explorers and exploration routes across the continent. Uh, which is most visibly seen in maps like this uh, 1960s pictorial map of Australia, uh, which is an exploration map and is all about the kind of white explorers traversing this landscape and what they discovered along the way. Uh, so we wanted to move away from these sorts of uh, representations and the periodization of, of uh, kind of mapping and uh, landscape that kind of pivoted around that colonial moment uh, and look at broader stories, broader histories uh, in collaboration with uh, indigenous communities around the country. Now, I did some early tests in the first few months and I'm just going to um, talk a bit about the kind of evolution of how we got to where we are today as part of this. Um, so I did some experiments in the kind of early days thinking, well, what sort of data could we start playing with? What sort of things could we do here? Um, so this is a shape file of Australia. Uh, I was interested in bunions at the time and I was looking at uh, Bunyip sightings and the way that these tied into long-standing kind of cultural stories and traditions about landscape, about environment, about waterways, about usage of resources uh, that uh, had a, a lot of really interesting knowledge kind of built in uh, about the, you know, things like Bunyip's coming to get people because of overfishing in particular areas that were actually about uh, resource management in particular areas over really long periods of time. Uh, but these are Bunyip sightings from newspaper reports in Trove uh, that I geolocated. Interestingly, uh, a lot of these did have also uh, reports of uh, Aboriginal people's accounts of what these uh, creatures or beings might be. Uh, when you're talking about Bunyip, you talk about waterways, uh, and this is a slightly sketchy waterway shape file. Uh, but you immediately start running into problems of well, where do you find uh, you know shape files or geolocated data of historic waterways at different periods in time over kind of long periods of time, uh, and you quite quickly run into some uh, data issues about how to do this uh, within the constraints of a you know what in the grand scheme of things is a relatively short project with not many people involved. Uh, there were. Other sorts of data I thought we could layer in here, um, again, just experimenting, uh, there was some thought that the, the sound of the Australasian bittern might be mistaken for the kind of booming roar of a bunion. Uh, so I was looking at, well, where are these uh, sightings in the 19th century? And an Australasian bittern sightings across that area by the Atlas of Living Australia that show some really interesting kind of clustering around some of the sites where bunions were also uh, reported to be sighted. There are other theories about leopard seals, which seem slightly more dubious because there's never been a sighting of a recorded sighting of a leopard seal on any of these inland waterways. Uh, and you look up by inland, some of these kind of sites are. Uh, and in terms of long histories, there were some thoughts about bunyips might be potentially being related to uh, you know, extinct megafauna like the protodon. Uh, and you can get some data from things like fossil 2.0 of uh, protodon finds around this part of the country. Uh, I also did some mapping that I'm not going to show, uh, and I'll let you know why, but uh, the, uh, you know, IATIS map of Indigenous Australia, just interested to see whether some of these locations clustered in particular language groups or communities and potentially, uh, you know, as, as potential collaborators that we could work with. Uh, but uh, for those who don't know, the IATIS map of Indigenous Australia comes with usage restrictions on it that says that you shouldn't overlay images or text and you shouldn't add geospatial mapping. So although I did that kind of on my personal computer, I'm not going to show it here. Uh, then the pandemic hit, um, and here's a pandemic map, when we're talking maps. Um, this obviously put real constraints on our field work and started to reshape the kind of projects that we were trying to do in the research centre. Um, but also, I mean, you look at a map like this from the pandemic, and it's a very data intensive map. It's about mapping, um, you know, quite uh, large scale data sets compared to what we were looking at. And it comes with a bunch of questions of, well, what is deep history data? What does deep history data look like? What sort of data sets are we talking about here? 
uh, and does this kind of data intensive mapping approach and GIS approach uh, bring anything that's kind of relevant or useful uh, to the deep history field? And when looking at data intensive mapping and the, the experiments that I just showed, there's actually a real problem there. Uh, one of the reasons that I didn't continue with them, uh, because uh, there are problems with that uh, in that it uses colonial newspapers as sources, it uses Western scientific data as putting those two things together. Uh, it's potentially open to claims, uh, perhaps quite rightly, that uh, it's an attempt to kind of validate uh, stories of bunyips and uh, and indigenous knowledge using Western scientific data to prove whether it's true. Uh, and this can come with uh, real kind of intellectual and philosophical issues and it just uh, didn't sit right with the work that we were trying to do. So we moved away from that really data intensive approach and thought, well, we're not gonna be producing maps here that are about many, many locations and sites right across the continent with really kind of uh, large scale GIS data sets. Um, we looked at, possibly doing archival work, particularly during the pandemic, but there are significant issues there too. You know, we can't just mine knowledge out of the archives, even if it's officially on the public record and start putting this stuff on maps and making them publicly accessible and visible, uh, because that's opening up a whole uh, kind of range of information uh, that potentially was collected under dubious circumstances and you still need to do uh, the community relationship work around that. Uh, and, there was some talk about mapping sites related to the long human history of the continent that were already known and open, like indigenous tourism sites and working with communities that uh, ran uh, tourism uh, operations in different parts of the country. And that wasn't quite clear what we were adding to that equation other than kind of aggregating existing data under a kind of deep history lens. Um, so we started to move uh, in different directions. Uh, by the end of 2021, we had a very kind of rough uh, demo version uh, just to show people the stage of the work that we were at that we showed at the Australian Historical Association conference. Uh, I'm just going to run some very short highlights from that. So we had a few stories from different locations around the country. There was a national map down the bottom with, uh, with some clickable sites that I'll show you more in a moment. This was a very kind of text heavy version of this. Uh, it was um, probably a bit too academic for the uh, approach that we ultimately want to take. It included things about geological timescales and changing environments. Uh, when you got down to the uh, further down in these stories, there were um, embedded leaflet maps with clickable locations, some uh, information there. Uh, there we go, that's still going. Uh, and this is a more of the sort of full screen uh, atlas component of it where we had clickable sites around the country. This is zooming in on Greek Island uh, with a few sites there and you can click on sites and get some information about for example the creation of these landscapes and we also had shape files for things like changing coastlines and we had three shape files uh, at different depth levels so that we could show that changing coastline uh so this is where we were at the end of 2021 um emerging from all of this though uh it became increasingly clear through this that the deep history work uh was about deep engagement and co-creation with communities working at a really local level. Uh, and rather than these kind of national perspectives and continually focusing on this continental perspective, uh, we started to develop stories at a local level that were actually quite visually distinct in many ways for the individual communities that we were working with. And so the approaches started to emerge uh, directly from those uh, community relationships. Uh, so I'm just going to step through uh, a few of the examples of where we're headed for this. Uh, this is still kind of work in progress. Uh, but for example, uh, Ben Silverstein and I are doing work with the Yalu community uh, up around Broome, and that's Broome in the top of this image you can see there with the curve of Roebuck Bay. And down the bottom of Roebuck Bay uh, is a really significant cultural landscape that then became uh, Bangu Pastoral Station, uh, and there were various kind of access issues and things around that landscape. Uh, but this was a story, uh, although there are significant sites here of things like indigenous wells that were also used for driving cattle through this country, uh, and we may plot some of those uh, and geolocate some of those sites uh, as part of this story. It's also a story of movement, of people moving backwards and forwards around this bay, of people uh, coming across the bay on boats at different times, uh, and even of people looking across the bay, uh, either being in Broome and looking across to Bangu Station uh, and remembering time there or being on Bangu Station and looking back across the broom. Uh, 
Uh, so it's about kind of movement and perspective through this landscape, and we're looking at different ways of capturing uh, that that's not just about having kind of geolocated individual sites. Uh, we're looking at incorporating some um, Indigenous ways of mapping. Uh, this is a map of part of the Palmer River in Queensland that's part of a rock art site on Quinkin country on Cape York Peninsula. Uh, some of the sites here are believed to be you know, somewhere between kind of 15 and 30,000 years old as uh, rock art sites. Uh, this uh, image of the river is not uh, thought to be that old, uh, but it's, uh, you know, it's still really interesting to see different ways of kind of uh, drawing diagrams of, of different parts of this country. Uh, also working with community members, uh, this is Leah Umbagai uh, on the Western Kimberley, uh, who sees the naming of her country and the animals and beings of that country in language as a really important part of conveying uh, knowledge about that country and painted this uh, kind of mud map of the area with the uh, her own icons on there uh, and having the language names attached to those. Um, so rather than using kind of satellite images and using those more familiar mapping tools, we're creating digital versions of this map and using the icons that she drew uh, to then place in different places on that map. We may animate some of them, uh, include the language names. Uh, and so it's a, a representation of that country that has emerged directly from the community members that we're working with. Uh, we're looking to draw on existing knowledge that's already out there. Uh, I showed you the Group Islands version from the, the 2021 demo where we had three sites on that uh, landscape. This is uh, from the uh, Anindiliakwa Land Council, uh, and these are the names of coastal locations in language from around Group Island, and you can see the uh, extraordinary level of kind of cultural knowledge and cultural naming that happened in this landscape. Uh, so we want to, uh, you know, draw on some of this work and, and help reveal some of that uh, within this kind of broader context. Uh, this is some work that Amy Way has been doing following a trip that she and Anne McGrath did up to Carnarvon Gorge with Uncle Fred Conway and Professor Jackie Huggins. Uh, and thinking about uh, stories like this that do have sites on a map and some really interesting sites on a map, but also is about the kind of movement through country and the journey and experience of walking through this country uh, with elders and with members of the community who tell you things along the way and tell you about uh, you know, bush medicines or different types of trees or um, telling stories about the landscape as they move through. Uh, so capturing some of that kind of experience of moving through country uh, as part of stories like this. And we do still have some uh, very data rich maps, but in a different sort of way to the, the shape files and things I showed earlier. So this is a painted map of the Willandra Lakes district, uh, painted by Kim Mahood, working with communities uh, and families in that region. Uh, and the reason why it's so small on here is the actual map itself is like a couple of meters wide. It's on a huge canvas that takes a big wall to hang it on. It has colored uh, maps of um, or sort of diagrams of families moving through the landscape, where people were born, where people uh, married, where they worked, movement in and out of missions, uh, really rich kind of family stories on this uh, also ancient landscape because it's surrounding Lake Mungo and that kind of area that's very familiar from a deep history perspective. And so it's overlaying these kind of family histories on a deep history landscape uh, and looking at creating a digitized version of this that's well underway where we've pulled that um, painted map apart into uh, sort of vector layers with each of the family stories as a separate layer. So you can bring different family stories in and out. You can potentially animate some sections of it uh, and provide a real uh, kind of digital interface where people can explore this as a, as a kind of rich set of uh, community data and knowledge about that region. Uh, so those are the kind of community specific directions we're heading in. As you can see, they're all uh, a little distinct because that's emerging from those local engagements with communities uh, and stepping away from the kind of national atlas level that we might have initially thought. As to what it all looks like when it's finished, uh, we need to wait a few more months. Uh, it's due for launch on the 22nd of November, 2022. Uh, I'm sure it will be widely publicized around that time. So watch out for marking country mapping deep histories. Uh, coming in late November. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Um, so we're going to hand over to uh, Ben Morgan now. If you'll be to go.
We are grappling with a few interesting technological technological challenges to uh, do the hybrid seminar in an effective way, I think. So Ben is going to project from yeah. the Should I unmute here or uh, leave it on mute because we'll need to speak so long. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for um, inviting me to present today. It's really exciting to not only get to present um, this research, but to present it within the context of um, historians as well. Um, my background is mostly cultural studies. I'm in literature now, so it's um, kind of a real privilege to get to share the space um, with historians. Um, and thank you for your presentation, Mike. It was really interesting, and I can see some intersections um, with stuff that I'm thinking about, about non-cartographic approaches to map, um, mapping cultural texts. Um, but today, um, I'd like to present some research from my um, my PhD, um, this is the first section of my PhD, um, which is about exploring the relationship between bushfire reporting and um, fictional representations of bushfires in 19th century texts that were published in um, Australian newspapers. Um, I'd just like to acknowledge that I'm speaking from unceded um, Aboriginal land today and to pay my respects to any Indigenous people um, here in the room or on Zoom as well. So the intention behind this particular project was to explore the relationship between bushfire reporting and, um, and fiction in 19th century Australian newspapers. I'll try and just give a brief overview of the project itself, as well as the digital methodology that I used, and um, also indicate, uh, I suppose, gesture towards the research potential of this particular kind of um, approach to um, mapping, but also highlight the difficulties and shortcomings as well. So the final map that um, I'm showing here um, is composed of two primary data sets. So the historical bushfire data set is derived from about 5,000 newspaper articles that mention bushfires that was harvested from Australian newspapers across the 19th century, um, mostly 1850 to 1900. And these are represented by the red dots that you can see. The fiction that was used for this research was extracted from about 250, 43 novellas um, and short stories that reference bushfires that were also published in Australian newspapers across the 19th century. And these are represented um, by those green dots. Um, so I was very much interested in the idea that you have the kind of fictionalization and the reportage happening in the same material kind of medium and was interested in the potential that mapping could bring to bring those two things back together, I suppose, in a different format. So to construct this map, I used two primary approaches or technologies, which was named entity recognition, um, and then also a custom querying of the gazetteer of historical Australian place names from the time layer cultural map, which um, Bill actually helped me with this project. So it's kind of, it's exciting to present it with you today. Um, so just very basically named entity recognition um, identifies proper nouns, um, predominantly locations, organizations, or persons in unstructured text. So I use this to just very kind of brutally pull out place names from both genres of writing. The place names that I extracted from the collection of the bushfire fiction though, um, did, did not and mostly don't in any way necessarily correlate with the location of the bushfire within the narrative itself, which is what I was really interested in trying to identify. And ultimately, the only way that I could find the locations of these bushfires um, in the fiction and assign the correct geographic location um, was by reading them all closely. So, this, this wasn't the case though with the newspaper articles. Um, named entity recognition is domain dependent. So 
It is designed for, and it's most effective um, at extracting event related information from journalistic text. And usually it responds to these five typical questions in the journalism domain of what, where, when, who, and why, which are capable of summarizing events and news. And accordingly, this could be used remarkably well to capture the geographic location of the bushfires um, in the newspaper reporting. And um, based on the formalism of newspaper reporting, it was also possible to develop a rule-based approach to the identification of geographic information pertaining to historical fires, just by isolating my search to a 200 word proximity um, surrounding the stream, the word bushfire itself, I was able to extract location entities of meaningful semantic significance to my research question, which was what is the geographic location of bushfires in these articles. And so this diagram um, shows the two pipelines that we use to generate both data sets. Um, and as you can see here, I, I couldn't use the same um, pipeline for both corpuses, the, the journalism and the fiction. Um, really, it was just necessary to read the fiction to identify the location of the fire within the narrative that couldn't be computationally automated. Now, the difficulty in attributing a geographic location to fires in fiction through the use of named entity recognition comes down to the fact that geographic indeterminacy is really a very important feature of literature um, itself. And based on close reading, indeterminate locations were actually one of the most prominent settings for these narratives, so where the fire was taking place. In other instances, I couldn't resolve the location beyond the identification of a colony. And even if a narrative did mention the location of a bushfire by place name, and optimistically, this was also accurately identified by the algorithm, the classifier itself. Um, there really was no formal um, or rule-based way to disambiguate the relevance of this particular place name from other place names within that chapter. So despite these limitations, this approach still did lead to some important research findings albeit um, ones that were much more circumscribed in scope than I initially env envisioned. So based on this acknowledgement of how differently named entity recognition handled different genres of writing, at this stage, I started to think of it more as a form of information retrieval that would help direct me towards close reading or what to read, rather than as a tool that would produce two comparative data sets to be interpreted through statistical analysis. So my approach um, to reading the map that I constructed was guided by the well-known expression from geographer and cartographer Walter Chodler, who argued that everything is related, but near things are more related than distant things. And I used some fairly accessible digital mapping software just to add hyperlinks um, back to the original text of the newspaper articles and of the fiction, and then also a timeline and other filtering devices so I could now read um, the moments of geographic convergence between the data sets. This fairly um, simplistic approach did reveal the enduring significance of the fire disaster Black Thursday that took place on February the 7th, um, 1851 in bushfire fiction and in the reporting across the 19th century. Black Thursday was perhaps the first major fire disaster since European colonization. And although no official records exist, it's estimated that almost a quarter of the colony of Victoria was burned. Narrative accounts of Black Thursday demonstrate a clearly identifiable relationship with journalistic accounts of the event. That is, there's this strong alignment between the place names featured in reporting on the event and in the fiction itself. Moreover, the place names in narrative accounts of Black Thursday correspond directly with the narrative setting of the stories as the authors are clearly choosing to position the narratives in areas that were identifiably affected by the disaster. And so this is just um, some of the stories that mention Black Thursday, as well as the place names that occur across the reporting of that event and of the fiction. So based on this finding, I attempted to identify narratives of more localized or defined geographies. Um, and I started thinking about using place names to create these minimal bounded areas that I was thinking of as geographic extents of narratives. Um, 
And as was the case with um, just kind of looking for these moments of convergence between the two data sets, so the red dots and the green dots occurring um, together, um, this particular approach um, based on this definition of geographic extent reveals Black Thursday stories to be those with the most clearly defined narratives, um, uh, sorry, most clearly defined geographies. So the narratives with the smallest geographic extent included the serials um, Black Thursday, um, published in 1856 by William Howard, and Whose Crime, um, published in 1894, which I, through this process, discovered to actually be just um, a plagiarism of William Howard's narrative. Um, <laughs> yeah. So um, the map on the right is just one of the chapters from William Howard's um, short story, which puts the opening of that story in the Apollo Bay um, region. So Black Thursday, um, published in 1856 by William Howard, is the only bushfire narrative that I, to, to my knowledge, is consistently republished in Australian newspapers for the remainder of the 19th century. It's a tale of settler endurance that features protagonist Robert Patterson successfully nav navigating the devastation of Black Thursday. It's partly a revision of Howlett's own reporting on the event that drew together different newspaper accounts to present a sensational report of unprecedented destruction. Um, while Howlett's reporting pre pre presents Black Thursday as a disaster without parallel, he also contextualizes the event as entirely avoidable, the cumulative product of drought and the indis indiscriminate use of fire. He gestures towards complacency by new settlers and the Victorian government, as he notes that there is a legal penalty for leaving a fire unattended, but quote, nobody ever regards it because I do not believe it's ever in inflicted, end quote. Despite this, fire historian Paul Collins argues that the practical lessons that could have been learned from the disaster were quickly forgotten, setting a pattern that has been followed, that has followed, been followed after every major fire disaster since. It was only six days after Black Thursday that Edward Hargraves discovered nuggets of gold west of Bathurst, thereby setting in motion mass emigration to Australia as prospectors sought fortune in gold. Five months after Black Thursday and only two weeks after Victoria had been declared an independent colony, gold was discovered east of Melbourne on the Yarra River. The disaster baptised the new colony and perfectly prepared the land for prospecting. It would take nearly half a century and another major fire disaster for significant fire reform to eventually be implemented. <clears throat> the reasons for this um, are unclear and available fire histories of Australia are largely silent on the years intervening between Black Thursday in 1851 and the next reported fire disaster, Red Tuesday, that took place at the end of the century in 1898. Again, Paul Collins argues that the lack of primary material for the period can be attributed to the ubiquity of fires, and he writes that it's clear from many 19th century sources that bushfires had become an inescapable part of summer life in Australia. But the history of bushfires in the second half of the century is fragmentary because they were so common, they were not reported unless they were close to settled districts widespread or disastrous. Reviewing the articles um, on the bush map um, through close reading, however, it became apparent why an argument for underreporting might have been falsely assumed. Although some news articles do contain headlines that detail destructive bushfires, many of the articles are just correspondence reporting that are providing updates on a region, as can be seen in the article on the left, that's a report on Newcastle. All this information might be encapsulated in other general area reporting, as is the case with the article on the right titled The Country. 19th century settler fire histories bookended by Black Thursday, 1851, and Red Tuesday, 1898, with relatively little that's written about the intervening years. The observation that reporting of bushfires may have changed across the century led me to identify a third major disaster, Black Monday, that took place the 27th of February, 1965. In journalistic accounts, Black Monday is described as the second great fire disaster of the colony. Nonetheless, it quickly fades from cultural memory, and by the turn of the century, the event is completely forgotten 
when it's excluded from a list of significant fires in the Victorian Royal Commission into Fire Protection in Country Districts in 1900. Across the late 1870s and early 1880s, Victoria experienced regular and devastating bushfires, but unlike the extensive multi-page features that followed disasters such as Black Thursday and Black Monday, bushfire reporting became increasingly succinct. This shift in reporting, as well as the retroactive erasure of Black Monday as a significant disaster, seems to support historian claims that fires did become more frequent and severe across the period of the 1870s and 80s. But to return to my focus on the relationship between reporting and fiction, the inability to connect other bushfire narratives with historical fires beyond Black Thursday may be partially attributable to the fact that across the 19th century and is evidenced by Black Monday, the category of disaster itself was seemingly um, unstable. The nomenclature Black Monday is seemingly erased as bushfires of greater geographic scale and fatalities occurred with increased frequency. The enduring cultural significance of Black Thursday in fiction and reporting, however, both normalises and diminishes the severity of subsequent bushfires. In journalistic accounts, Black Thursday is often invoked as a means of context contextualising and containing the scale of disaster. And in fiction, Black Thursday is presented as an unfortunate accident that can be attributed to the careless use of fire rather than the result of the systemic impacts of colonisation, the alteration of the land's biota through agricultural practices and the interruption of Indigenous fire management regimes. Rather than ensuring that the practical lessons of disaster are heeded, these narratives then seem to only operate to reassure settler culture that Black Thursday was an aberration, an accident, and part of the growing pains of the new colony. That is, of course, until the next disaster. Thank you. <clears throat> we will just be doing a quick tech handover to Emma. Okay. Um. I need to uh, share my screen. Let me see. How is that? Perfect. Oh, excellent. I expected that to be more difficult um, than it was because I am not uh, a digital expert at all. Um, very excited to be here though and to learn about these projects and um, present this one. Thank you so much for the invitation. Um, I'll uh, begin by acknowledging that I am on the unceded lands of the Bedigal people up here uh, in Sydney. I pay my respects to Bedigal people and their elders past, present and emerging and extend that respect to any Indigenous or Torres Strait Island people present here today. Okay, my talk today is called um, Mapping Histories of Blackbirding and the Pacific Labor Trade. And in it, I'm going to provide an overview of a database and digital mapping project that my colleague here at UNSW, Emma Christopher, and I are working on uh, in collaboration with Imelda Davis, Chairwoman of the Australian South Sea Islanders, Port Jackson. So this project is very much uh, in its infancy. Um, but we think it will provide really uh, critical new knowledge and awareness about the mobilization and exploitation of Pacific Islanders as laborers, both in colonial Australia and elsewhere in the Pacific. So many of uh, us here today, I'm sure, will be familiar with the labor system known as the Pacific labor trade. That system of cheap migrant labor recruited to serve expanding European economic and imperial interests across the Pacific Ocean in the 19th and 20th centuries. An estimated 1.5 million Pacific Islanders and a further 500,000 Asians were embroiled in this labor regime between 1863 and the outbreak of World War II. So we're talking about large numbers of people. They were transported from their homes in places ranging from India to Kiribati, principally to provide labour for European-owned plantations in Fiji, Samoa and, of course, Northern Australia. 
Within uh, historiographies of the labour trade, perhaps the key debate um, in the literature has been about whether and to what extent uh, the trade was characterised by coercion or by consent. From the outset, excuse me, um, here we go. From the outset, uh, the labour trade had its European critics who characterised it as nothing other than an extension of the slave trade. Blackbirding, as many of us who will know, became the shorthand for this slavery-like system of forced labour migration in which labourers were, quote unquote, recruited largely through acts of violence, kidnapping and trickery. Um, some scholars, however, have critiqued this narrative for its failure to take Pacific Islanders' role in the labour trade into consideration. The island-centred historiographies that emerged largely out of ANU beginning in the 1960s and 70s complicated a straightforward interpretation of the labour indenture as slavery. Placing Islanders' agency at the centre of their analyses, these works have productively challenged Eurocentric narratives of imperial activity highlighting instead processes of exchange and entanglement. The picture that is subsequently emerging of the labor trade is a complex one, demanding attention be paid to local situations, to a variety of historical actors, and to specific episodes and instances that mark recruitment across the Pacific. Historians know that colonialism was and is inherently and systematically violent. Questions still remain about how Pacific Islanders and colonists alike navigated, contested and reconfigured relations of power, violence, subordination and exploitation in this context. And these are some of the questions we, we are seeking to address with the development of the Pacific Islander labour database. And I'll say more about that shortly. I um, want to briefly discuss some of the sources from my archives that um, are helping us to tell these stories. And as mentioned, I'm a historian of the German Pacific, so I'll be focusing on those sources here. So the documents you see here are pages from the accounts of two traders who in 1883 were stationed on what is today New Ireland, Papua New Guinea. The trader whose account you see on the left was stationed at Kapsu, the one on the right was stationed at Nusa. Uh, these are both located toward the northwestern end of the island, uh, which was a fertile ground for labor recruiters during this period. Uh, both of these men were employed by the German trading company Hernsheim & Co, which had already established a presence in the islands and elsewhere in the Pacific prior to German annexation in 1884. Reading these accounts, certain familiar themes are evident. Um, recruiters exchanging firearms for New Guinean recruits and the absence of any interpreters on board the recruitment ships, for instance. The accounts also detail the violence of the labour trade and provide insights into Islanders' experiences of it. Take the following account of the Maria, for example. This was an English ship recruiting for Fiji. And this account is from the trader who was stationed at Noosa. The trader was on board a Queensland recruitment ship, the Kiara, conversing with the captain, quote, when suddenly we saw the workers with, when suddenly we saw the workers with whom I had found, sorry, I've done something to my text here, whom I had found on board the Maria, jumping overboard from all sides and swimming to both banks. The captain of the Maria was absent with his boats to recruit new laborers. A pursuit of the escapees could therefore not take place. The gunfire which the ship's crew opened on fleeing people was apparently unsuccessful. After a while, however, a boat was dispatched from the Chiara to help several people from the crew of the Maria who had jumped into the water to swim after the runaways. A woman belonging to the escaped laborers was attacked again from this boat. The woman was brought back on board the Maria and there beaten bloody and put in irons. When this trader had earlier been aboard the Maria, he found 76 recruits on board who were all locked in a room below the deck with only one small hatch open. They were allowed on deck for just two hours a day under close supervision of the ship's crew. So given this, it should 
come as no surprise that these people took the opportunity to flee when they had the, when they had the chance. So this is another kind of document that uh, I work with uh, from in my research on German colonial New Guinea. Uh, and this is a recruitment log. These became standard in the German colony and they provide some important insights into the history of this labor trade. From documents like this, we can learn the names of people who were recruited or at least how they sounded to the person doing the recruiting. We can learn their gender, their approximate age, the date they were recruited and from which village or location. We can also learn about the duration of the labor contract, the nominal uh, monthly wage they would have received and the entity for whom they were recruited. And in this particular case from 1904, it was the German colonial administration doing the recruiting, using this ship, the Zabra, to transport these people from today's New Island to the colonial capital in Herbertshoa, which is today's Kokopo in New Britain. We can see how these individuals left their marks or signatures on the recruitment record, ostensibly an indicator of a freely entered into contract or consent. But of course, we also have sources that directly and explicitly contradict the idea that all recruitment was consensual. This, uh, for example, is the record of a case that came before a German colonial court in 1902. And it involves the same recruitment ship that I just mentioned, the Zabra. Again, recruiting for the German administration in uh, New Guinea. Records like this one contain the mediated testimonies of so-called recruits, uh, and I think they are critical sources for understanding how the Pacific labor trade in all its variants manifested on the ground. This particular case tells the story of a woman named Galdu from Bellio Island off the coast of mainland New Guinea near present-day Madang. Galdo, Galdu had been taken aboard the Zabra from her home to be transported to the colonial capital of Herbertshoa and delivered to a German colonial judge who had apparently bought her from a colleague on the mainland who had himself recently returned on leave to Germany. Testifying before the colonial court, Galdu's words went something like this. This morning, the captain came with his crew to Baleo and tried to convince the men there to go with him to Herbert's Hoor. The men didn't comply. The captain then threatened them. He started ranting. The men, ran, the men then ran away. Only Nylon stayed behind with me and he persuaded me to get in a canoe in which he took me to the ship, but only because he had to. Nylon himself said that he only did this out of fear because otherwise their homes might be burned down. When I left my people, we all cried. I absolutely wanted to go back, but I was scared because the captain ranted a lot, so I stayed on board. The Baleo people refused the trade goods that were offered to them. A few sticks of tobacco were left on Baleo, but the men wouldn't smoke them. So with sources like this, the violence uh, and coercion that characterized the colonial labor indenture uh, are palpable. Uh, the threats, and fears of reprisals for non-compliance are explicit and there's a knowledge of what these reprisals could and did look like. The islanders refusal of trade goods and their refusal to smoke the tobacco are also telling. They did not consent to Gelder's removal and clearly neither did she. So sources like these court records, recruitment logs, traders accounts, among a host of other archival materials and um, contemporary newspaper sources contain a whole host of information about the history of the Pacific labor trade. But these are sources that uh, also remain inaccessible to many people uh, due to issues of language, location, education, funding, etc. Which brings me back to the database project that Emma and I, Emma Christopher, to avoid confusion, and I are developing in collaboration with the Australian South Sea Islanders, Port Jackson. So we're drawing upon the groundbreaking work um, achieved by the Transatlantic Slave Trade Database, which you can see here and um, some of you may already be familiar with, to um, develop a Pacific Islander labor database that will 
function in much the same way as an extensive searchable and online record of the colonial trade in Pacific Islanders. This database project is driven by a number of goals. Um, firstly, by amassing information on the labor trade and its various actors, it will itself serve as a critical tool for further research. Uh, but also through the database, uh, we hope to make these critical histories of Pacific labor recruitment, migration and exploitation more broadly accessible. The prototype we are currently developing has uh, begun to map labour recruitment voyages from the New Guinea Islands to Australia, Fiji, Samoa and within New Guinea itself. So here is a screenshot. This is still very much under development. So this is quite rough, but here's a screenshot of how we're going about this. Uh, and this is just the information from the Zabra that I showed you the archival file of before um, entered in to the, the database. Uh, further, as you can see here, and this is where things get very exciting and I think um, really speak to the mapping part of this seminar, um, the database will allow us to map these individual voyages showing where people were taken from and where they were sent. Location pins, marking places where islanders boarded and disembarked recruitment vessels will be interactive so as to maintain the, the qualitative information that we have available. So by clicking on any one of these pins, users of the database will be able to access known historical details of what happened at that place during the voyage in question. Just uh, finally, a couple of final thoughts. By working uh, with the Pacific Islander communities and their representatives, um, we're committed to building a tool that is both culturally sensitive and useful to those communities. Allying with the Find and Back Family Initiative of the Australian South Sea Islander community, this database will allow Pacific Islanders and their diasporas to research their histories and potentially connect with lost family. <clears throat> Given ongoing resonances between the colonial labour trade and such initiatives as Australia's current Pacific labour scheme, we see an urgency and contemporary significance to this project. Uh, it will allow us to map long histories of labour extraction and exploitation that continue to this day. By providing a critical tool to researchers, educators, students and others, uh, the database will enable a more comprehensive and nuanced understanding of our past and present, shedding new light on Australia's deep historical involvement in trans-imperial systems of unfree labour. Thank you. Thank you, Emma. Um, so presuming everyone online can still hear us and we haven't lost you in the also, the handover. Uh, we're going to hand over to Bill. Okay, thank you. Um, let's share my screen. Hey, um, hi everyone, and uh, thanks for having me here today. Um, I pay my respects to Gunnawal and Gambri. Elders, past, present, and future. Um, I'm here from the University of Melbourne, which is in uh, Warren, Wurundjeri Woi Warren uh, country of the Kulin Nation. Uh, but most of the work of, on the Colonial Frontier Massacres map was done in Wabakul and Waramai country uh, in, at the University of Newcastle. So the Colonial Frontier Massacres map. Um, project began eight years ago in 2014 with an ARC grant um, uh, for three years and was led by, and still is led by Professor Lyndall Ryan at the University of Newcastle. Uh, the team has included um, a fair few historians from various parts of the country, each focusing on, on different states and digital humanities software developers and research assistants. We released the map in stages and we're just finalizing a few things before concluding work and archiving the data. Um, so we started with the east coast of Australia uh, and then included um, Northern Territory and South Australia and then West Australia 
and um, also over time more sites emerged across the whole country. Uh, each time we release a stage, this, this is stage four that we're looking at now, um, we do get feedback from the, from the public uh, clarifying certain bits of information, sometimes giving us leads on, on sites. Uh, and so there's always a bit of a follow-up period where we, we make adjustments uh, before we can call it done. So, but hopefully we will be finished soon and, and can archive it and get a DOI sorted and all of that sort of thing. <clears throat> uh, consultation on this included sessions conducted through Wallatooka at the University of Newcastle, meeting with IAPSIS, uh, conferences, community visits, personal contacts, and the project employed a Wiradjuri software developer and a Darug Gamilaroi research assistant. My involvement is as a digital humanities software developer. Uh, what I do though isn't just technical, but involves figuring out, uh, well, it's quite interdisciplinary, really. I need to have a good understanding of, of um, the history and the political context and the ethical situations and how that crosses over with the technology. Um, so that includes translating often very vague and sketchy historical information into structured data for the database and considering the right way to represent it on the web uh, ethically and um, yeah, sometimes an aggressive political context. So some examples of how that works are in representation in um, politics, in the pragmatics of the project and um, in what you might call digital humanities theory. So some specific examples are in terms of representation, uh, the overall tone of the site. So one of the, uh, choosing the color of the dots, for example, was one of the first issues we had. We weren't expecting that to be, uh, involve a lot of discussion, but it involved a heck of a lot of discussion um, and feedback from a lot of people. Um, and we had to work our way through lots of different considerations. The color of the dot is, turns out to be quite important. Um, for example, the first, when I made a first draft and said, here's what it might look like and showed it to the history team, the, the dots were red, that stands up as quite a contrasting bold color, um, but it looked like a horror movie, basically like blood had been splattered all over the map of Australia, uh, which some might say is apt, but it seemed kind of sensationalizing to me. Also, some people we consulted with said, don't use red because for us, that's a color of celebration. Um, and we ended up yellow, I guess mainly just for two reasons. One is it stands out well, but also nobody objected to yellow. Um, <clears throat> and also just considerations like not having any pictures on the site um, out of respect for people rather than saying, you know, rather than providing that usual warning, this may contain pictures that may upset people. Um, we just thought, let's just respect that properly and not have pictures. Um, the naming of sites, also a very difficult problem to grapple with. Um, many of the sites we know occurred in a certain place, but there's not a, like the Mile Creek Massacre is, is a kind of like a massacre with a name, the Mile Creek Massacre, it's well known. A lot of the massacres we don't didn't have an established name to work with. It's not my place to name these sites, and yet we can't consult with every single community across the country. So that was quite difficult. Um, in the end, we just um, chose what seemed to be the most sensible name, but leave it open for people to to request it be changed and corrected, which has happened in in some cases. Uh, so in, in terms of the politics of it, um, it is very political, politi politically sensitive, uh, especially because of the history wars, or the history of the history wars. Um, <clears throat> so that involves, uh, you know, specific questions as well, like what to include and what to exclude. Some, um, uh, we even had to just decide whether to include massacres of colonists or not. Uh, you know, what sort of 
comments is that going to generate in social media if we don't include them and if we do include them um, thinking through those sorts of issues. Uh, establishing policies for reusing the information, um, figuring out some of the terminology we use. Do we call people who commit massacres perpetrators, killers, murderers, attackers? Um, and also, what's our attitude and our stance? Do we engage in social media or not? Um, and well, in, in a lot of cases, it's come down to not taking the bait from people like massacre denialists who are trying to generate a controversy again, because this is about reconciliation, that we don't want to get into a big argument about it. We want to, and our role in, in academia is to reliably inform public debate. So that's what we try and do. And it turns out that that has worked out quite well. When, when you see arguments on social media, you see, see people saying things which are obviously wrong. Somebody else comes in and says, actually, no, you can see on the map that provides this evidence. And so it's fulfilling its function um, in that way. <clears throat> uh, so, and I guess in terms of the pragmatics of the project, there's a lot of uh, the stuff you normally find in digital humanities projects where the information you have is quite um, vague, it's in prose form, it's not in tables and that sort of thing. So um, for me, working with the historians, we had to put a lot of effort into um, figuring out how to turn that information into something that can be processed by a computer. Uh, you know, what, what, what are the categories that would make sense in an Excel spreadsheet, for example. Um, and also how not to lose sight of the important historical context and the historical stories while we're doing that. So as well as the map, um, well, if you go to the introduction, there is, uh, sorry, the mouse is being a bit sensitive there. Sorry. So one way to put it, make sure it has contextualizing information is with all the other inf the other pages, such as the introduction, which describes the evidence, explains the data, um, some of the process we went through. Um, and also, uh, in each of the each of the sites, oops, sorry. Each of the sites, I'll just uh, pick one. Anyway, each one has a. You go to the details. Um, yeah. So the these are the sort of the data type in information that we established, but we also have a section for the narrative, which enables the historians to put in all of that background. What was the lead up? What was the follow up? In anything else that's relevant so that we don't lose that in the process of creating structured data. Um, in terms of some of the interesting digital humanity theories stuff that, that came out of this is, um, thinking about the difference between like what your digital humanities project is for in, in relation to your research. Is it there to illustrate your theory? Is it there to um, provide a research tool to, up to others? Or is it to answer a specific research question? So is it just to sort of engage people with your research findings or to specifically answer the question? Um, or provide a tool for others. And I mean, you kind of need to think about that when you're starting a project, but it's often the case that it fulfills all three functions. And I think that's the case with, with this one. Um, and uh, well, one of the more interesting things for me was um, when somebody asked, well, how do you prove, you know, in, in relation to that, if this is going to answer a research question, 
say the research question is, did massacres occur close to the frontier or not? Um, this was from someone overseas who isn't familiar with Australian history. And like, because for us, if you look at the map, it's pretty clear it, it matches the frontier over time. Um, but he wanted us to demonstrate or prove that computationally, which, and to do that, um, sorry, the mouse is acting up again. Oh, sorry, it's because the Zoom is not in the way. So for an Australian person, as we look at this over time, we can see that it matches the pattern of colonization, Sydney, Tasmania, Victoria, and then expanding up in, into the north. Um, but in order to demonstrate that massacres occur close to the frontier computationally, you would need to know where the frontier is. But it turns out we, nobody seems to, we, we, we don't know where it is. Settlers didn't follow up um, any government constraints. The geography of Australia means that it's very sparse and sporadic. It doesn't, it's not like it starts one place and then gradually expands. It's very patchy. There are all sorts of problems in trying to even figure out where the frontier is, which is actually something we're working on now in the, in the follow-up to this project. Um, and so you need to reverse that question and say that the massacres themselves indicate where the frontier is, well, where the frontier is, if you want to answer the question, where is the frontier? Massacres are one data set that will indicate that. Other data sets might be when were towns founded, uh, where did explorers go, um, pastoral expansion of uh, sheep and cattle and those sorts of things. We need to, we can only infer where the frontier was from data sets like this. Um, so that was just like an interesting theoretical uh, thing that came out of this. Um, so just, yeah, going back to the project in general then, um, the, out of about 414 frontier massacres on the map, 401 were of Aboriginal people. 12 were of colonists and one was of Macassans. Those numbers are still fluctuating slightly. We may add or remove one or two sites, um, but they're pretty close to what we'll end up with once we finalize it. Um, and our conservative estimate is that more than 10,000 people were killed in those massacres. So we, yeah, we use conservative estimates um, rather than a range because the conservative estimate is going to be more accurate Whereas the, you know, if you were to go from a minimum or a maximum, the maximum one is, is probably going to be uh, wildly variant. So um, we, we just stick with the conservative one. And that, that also is for, um, uh, for making a convincing argument as well because of the, the politics and the um, debate, debate around this. We want everything to be um, very defensible. So um, having a conservative estimate means it's going to stand up to just about anything. Um, one of the new findings in stage four is that um, agents of the state were involved in about half of the massacres. So that's police and soldiers, uh, government officials, um, which has often been a question in the past. Uh, to what extent did the government know what was going on um, and did they condone it and that sort of thing. Um, so with 50% involved, it, it's pretty clear that they weren't ignorant of it. Um, though if you look into the actual, I mean, obviously the situation's more complicated than that. The government had a, uh, the related, well, at least in Victoria, I've just been looking in, into Victoria recently. Um, the relationship of the government to settlers. On the one hand, the government was often quite annoyed with squatters for going beyond the law um, and often critical of them for, for their violence and brutality and immorality. Um, but at the same time, when 
they did send in, say, send in the troops, such as the native police, it, the result was the same. They committed massacres and violence. It was just on the government's terms rather than the, the squatters' terms. <clears throat> um, yeah, so one of the most important things about this map and one of the reasons I think it's been so successful in having about um, a million views um, of this site and then um, the, the Guardian's version of it, which is based on our data and they augment it slightly. Um, has, I don't know how many they've had, but it's, it's probably quite a lot more. So that kind of means that just everyone in Australia would know someone who, who knows someone who has looked at the map, at least seen it. Um, so that's kind of transformed this truth about our history from something that people only understood vaguely or it just generally wasn't that well known into something that's common knowledge. So I think it really has had an impact on Australian culture. <clears throat> and part of the reason for that is, is the storytelling aspect of it. Um, and it's successful on the web, I think, because it only takes one look, just a glance, and you see that there were many massacres in Australia. Um, it, it's, we did have to resist a lot of scope creep in, in terms of things that could be added to the map or different ways of visualising it and having options down the side and that sort of thing. But I think keeping it simple has, has helped in its impact. Um, and the storytelling of it, um, it sort of uh, draws you in the more detail you want. So you can t there's the story that you get from a glance, there's a story over time that you get from the, the time slider, and there's the story of each individual site. Um, and I, I think that helps people relate to it personally. Like one of the powers of the map is that um, you know, you typically go, well, uh, where do I live? I can see my house from here or whatever. You can see what happened near where you live and work. Um, so it gives that those places, those events much more um, tangibility, much more reality for you personally. You can see that, you know, the reason, well, the reason I'm able to live and work here is because of this violent history that happened just down the road. <clears throat> um, and it also, um, you know, kind of stories, places. Um, another power of the maps is that by reading the map, um, you learn something about a place and then every time you pass that place or go through that place, it has more meaning to you, whereas before it didn't. That was just a hill until I saw the map or, and what happened to learn about it, but now it means something. Um, and I think that uh, changes the way we relate to places and changes the way we value them. And it also change, changes the way we think about ourselves and the way we value, value ourselves. I mean, I grew up in some pretty homogenous, nameless suburbs that didn't have any meaning at all. Um, but on, on digging and doing some research, I found out there were, um, there were interesting places that I, I just didn't know about them. It wasn't part of our education. So I think that's um, one of the powers of digital mapping um, is to do that, to re-educate. Um, those of us who are ignorant of, of the meaning of places, um, especially the indigenous meaning, um, but also the, the whole history of, of uh, how we came to be here. Uh, yeah, so that's the Colonial Frontier Massacres map project, which is winding up. Um, but after that, we have a new grant through the University of Melbourne um, called Historical Frontier Violence, Drivers, Legacy, and the Role of Truth-Telling. So this project looks at what happened before and after massacres, I guess is a little way of summing up. Um, so what are the drivers of massacres? Why did they happen uh, across the whole country? And the intergenerational impact to up to today. Um, it's being run through an economics department. So they're, they're looking at the, the that's quite data driven. That's why there's, there's, there's a quantitative side and a qualitative side of the next project. 
the quantitative side is quite data driven. So comparing um, locations of massacres to to outcomes today for Indigenous and non-Indigenous people, and looking at um, settler attitudes as well. Uh, differences in education, health outcomes, and so on to 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 establish a uh, well to if there is to demonstrate the causal link between historical violence and the present circumstances. <clears throat> and the qualitative side, um, led by Judy Atkinson, um, works with is going to work with um, three communities around Australia. Um, and part of the the point behind that is that through understanding, according to Judy Atkinson's work, through understanding history, um, it, uh, people can work through the healing process much better. If you understand why things are as they are, you can um, under, better understand that they're not necessarily that way and that you can do something to change them. <clears throat> so, um, yeah, one of the main parts of, of the next uh, project is is the healing capacity of understanding this violent history. Um, well, I guess I'll leave it there. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Bill. Sorry. Thank you, Bill, for a really fascinating and uh, rich reflection on the, the map, which I think we can say is probably you know, for most people registering for this seminar, this is the map they 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 it comes to mind when you think about digital mapping and Australian history. Um, so I'm just going to ask a couple of questions of all of the panelists. While I'm doing that, do feel free. Uh, I think Amy's just put it in the chat actually to start putting uh, questions in the chat. I think it's going to be easiest if we put questions in the chat and then we'll read them out in the room for the sake of the recording. Um, and we do also, uh, we will need to change the audio very, very quickly uh, for Emma to contribute. So um, do feel free to just like flag our attention with the raise right hand function or something, Emma, when you want to jump in and we'll do the manual switch a little bit. Um, so the question that I think I'm hoping a lot of people will be, will be interested in is, could each of you just tell us a little bit about how you got into this world? This idea of using digital mapping as a, as a tool for historical research and for communication. You know, how did you end up acquiring the skills that you need to do, to do this? Is collaboration a big part of it? Can you reflect on that kind of your origin story in your mapping uh, experiences? I don't know if anyone wants to, to lead off. I think, I think Bill has been volunteered. Yeah, <laughs> sure. Yeah, I'm just happy. When it refer to others, but um, yeah, so um, I started out with an arts degree in um, English and philosophy. Um, then I had a baby and needed to get a job, and I it was it was uh, I know at the end of the recession, I guess, in the 90s, but the IT boom was starting, so I kind of had to go to IT, go into IT, there wasn't much choice about it. Um, but it turned out I was pretty good at it, um, so. Uh, I got work at the State Library and, and then at the University of Newcastle, um, I guess because I had the, the arts background as well. Um, but it was in pretty mundane IT work. So, you know, over the course of 10 years, um, I also did a honours and a PhD and managed to bring the boring IT work and the humanities stuff together um, through uh, Professor Hugh Craig at the University of Newcastle, Miami, um, who who was one of um, him and his supervisor were kind of seminal figures in digital humanities back in well, I don't know how far back they go, but a long way. Um, <clears throat> and then we made the well, the so other people like Will Smith um, and Patricia Pender were interested in in. Um, digital humanities and archives, uh, archives of women's literature, uh, and a few other interested people formed a Centre of 21st Century Humanities, um, which I was doing the digital humanities work in, uh, and through that met Lindell, um, who, was, who had this grant and needed a digital map 
and that's where we ended up with um, the colonial frontier massacres map. But mapping, I guess, particularly interests me as well because I also travelled a lot when I was a teenager. So I just, I just love looking at maps. And so I'm not happy to have a here. Um, from my point of view, uh, so I'm not a digital mapping expert by any means, uh, but uh, I kind of come at this through the, the structured data side of things, coming through archival work, coming through collections, documentation, uh, and working on public history projects uh, that were using databases to capture metadata instruction ways that we could then use to uh, talk about particular histories with broader audiences. Uh, with mapping being one of the kind of tools for visualizing that data in useful ways when you get your data structured right. So I kind of started at the data side of things rather than the visualizing side of things. But also done work in uh, you know, using things like network visualization as part of kind of relational data sets, uh, a little bit in kind of social network stuff, uh, as well as geographic stuff, as well as other visualization tools. Um, and uh, in terms of developing those skills, uh, I've worked with people who are mapping kind of experts in that space and picked it up. Uh, there's also, uh, just from a basic point of view, I feel like sometimes as a digital humanities scholar, uh, part of the key skill of being a scholar in that area is being able to search for stuff online and interpret the things that you read online and being able to apply it. So it's like, well, I know that that can be done and I know that people have done that before. Therefore, if I search for this and look around for a while, I can find some instructions and work out how to do it myself and just kind of teach yourself based on all these available kind of forums of knowledge that are accessible. Uh, so yeah, I feel like the projects I've come to, I've come to not knowing how to do the thing, I've come to it knowing how to find out how to do the thing uh, and then apply that in a useful kind of way. Different. Um, did you want to weep in? Yeah, sure, thanks. Um, uh, I, I work as a librarian and I've worked in libraries for um, the last decade or so as well. Um, so I think I've always been interested in um, the expansion of um, digital archives and um, a positive kind of attitude towards digital material as kind of this positive thing um, for posterity or accessibility or whatnot. Um, I, so I, I was interested in developing skills that would allow me to actually access and work with that material um, in a more um, direct sense. Um, my PhD um, was a defined PhD for the humanities, which is quite unusual which um, stipulated a geospatial analysis of colonial fiction um, based on the um, archive put together by my supervisor, Professor Catherine Goad. So I um, took on a project that basically I just had to learn how to um, be able to do computational um, work <laughs> because I knew that would be the only way I would learn. It's, um, it's yeah, it, it is a steep learning curve. Um, but uh, I, I think what is um, exciting or humbling for me is that the perceived kind of um, distinction between qualitative and quantitative methods or, or that kind of idea of this kind of deep chasm between the humanities and other kinds of disciplines is not as clearly delineated, I think, as might be initially perceived. Um, and invariably, what's become kind of um, perhaps a misperception of my work about extracting something from text that I might hold up as some kind of knowledge claim is realizing that the kind of metadata schemas or um, uh, just kind of ontologies that I create um, in order to render something computationally tractable is in and of itself an interpretation which is inherently qualitative as well. So um, you know these, these ideas of these divides as much as there are different skills um, they're much more closely related I think than yeah. Yeah this is super interesting discussion I think it's kind of democratizing in a way. So it's interesting that none of you have had like formal training. And many of this is a lot of experimentation and self-teaching. Um, so we'll just hand over to Emma if you're here. Yeah. Can you hear me okay? Um, so yeah, I mean, I think I'm very much still on that steep learning curve, really learning on the job. My background is not remotely in digital mapping or digital humanities, but the idea of creating this this resource uh, kind of necessitates these these range of skills. So obviously we have had Emma and I are both historians, um, very familiar with our our respective archives. Um, so really developing this has been a very collaborative uh, process, and we've been working with the software 
engineer for the prototype. Um, and that's really been a, a, a super interesting process involving a lot of back and forth communication about what makes sense, what is legible to us as historians, what makes sense from a developer's point of view and figuring out uh, how, how to bring that all together. And it's still, as I say, very much a work in progress, but um, I think it was really just uh, from Emma and my point of view, seeing the phenomenal potential that uh, a large scale online interactive uh, database and uh, digital map, the potential that that had um, for asking new research questions as historians for making this accessible um, has just necessitated that with the, the, the fact that we are still uh, learning and collaborating and it is, um, it is a difficult uh, process, but I think uh, one that's really uh, rewarding. Um, I also just wanted to extend um, what I was saying before about the project we're working on at the moment, uh, because it would be deeply problematic of me not to say this, uh, is that the actual development work is being done by Tash Swakia, who's our developer on the project. Uh, and a big shout to her for the incredible work that she does. Uh, a lot of people, when I give talks like this, um, or in general, assume that the white beardy guy is the guy who does all the coding and all the development work and that I know how to write, program and write code myself and everything else. I know a little bit of that stuff, but I'm not the person who does that work on our project. I'm kind of the in-between person who helps translate uh, some of the work of the historians on the project who haven't done this sort of work before to our developer and kind of sit in that middle point of prototyping and helping to do the design work that I don't do the actual coding. As a, as a big follow-up on that, how did you find your, your collaborator? You know, what was the process of that? Is that an open call? Was it through existing connections? What's the... uh, in this case, she was already on the project when I joined it. So that's probably <laughs> a question for uh, Anne Graf. We'll put it on this. Uh, but she had, she had uh, I think she's done a PhD at the School of Art and Design here in Italy, uh, which we hadn't continued at that stage, but uh, had connections with ANU, so it was through that project. Yeah. Um, to zoom out slightly, excuse the horrible pun. Um, you know, you've all come at this from really different sort of backgrounds. The projects have different kinds of genealogies, I guess. But I think a lot of people will be interested in kind of what, based on your experience, what are the kinds of projects that are suited to this sort of digital mapping output? Is there particular kinds of um, research topics or research questions? Are there particular data sets? You know, what, what goes into thinking that this could actually work as a, a digital mapping sort of output so it's a very broad question so feel free to pad while uh, giving your responses but if anyone wants to jump in um yeah well it probably all comes down to feasibility um so probably the first thing you need to do is is, is think about is this achievable um so i mean some of the typical projects that might um, lend themselves to digital humanities are ones that where where there is a pretty clear need for data um, driven answers um, where you can actually list things in a very large um, spreadsheet and also ones where data is already available so if if, if, if it's a data driven project but all of that information is is locked up in um, text that hasn't been scanned or, or text even if it has been scanned, you might still need to type it all into a spreadsheet. Is that going to take a research assistant um, two weeks or is it going to take, uh, you know, 10 years, in which case it's not possible? So, you know, you might look for scenarios where there's already existing neat data sets that are going to make your life easy. Um, and if not, are you going to be able to do that data entry yourself? Uh, yeah, but, but definitely shouldn't replace conventional or, or traditional research, though. I mean, people do sometimes get a bit paranoid that the computers are going to take over, um, <laughs> but uh, they, they definitely shouldn't. Um, they just, you know, it just augments um, your research. Um, it probably, you know, you'll probably factor it into your research. Yeah, um, and so I know Emma is ready to go, so we're going to get Ruth to do the switcheroo. Mm -hmm. 
Hello. Sorry, am I jumping in? Yes, please. <laughs> okay. Um, I think in, in our case, part of what um, really about this project that lends itself to digital mapping is just that we're dealing with very large numbers. Um, and importantly, we still don't know precise uh, numbers. We don't know how many people were taken from a particular location, how many people, we don't know how many Pacific Islanders were sent to colonial Australia. Um, so because we are dealing with large and unknown numbers, this is a really useful way to start building, building that information up just in terms of um, the raw data. And obviously for this project, because it's one about the movement of people, um, digital mapping is, it, it's, a, it's a great way to visualize that, but I think there is also uh, a significance to seeing those patterns of movement. Um, and that corresponds once again to the, the impact um, that the extraction of people from particular places has had and continues to have. Thanks, Emma. Um, did Ken or Mike, did either of you want to jump in on that? Um, yeah, um, in terms of um, mapping projects, I suppose I, I've also been thinking a lot about just beyond the kind of the visual of a kind of Cartesian or Euclidean map, also the technologies that have this kind of cartographic um, uh, lens, um, I suppose, behind them as well, that one is using to, to create um, these kinds of interfaces. Um, so I've been particularly interested in the limitations of using named entity recognition, um, which something like Stanford NER is a pretty standard kind of, um, uh, I suppose, package for any digital humanities projects. Um, but I suppose that the, the small project that I just presented pretty clearly demonstrates um, just how explicitly limited that technology is in its off-the-shelf kind of um, application. Um, you know, a place name in journalism versus a place name in fictional text are uh, totally different things, even though superficially they may appear to be um, somewhat synonymous. So a kind of uh, literacy, I suppose projects that work are ones that, um, I mean, are built on great optimism about the potentials of the technologies, but also a realistic appraisal um, of what the technology itself actually thinks language is. Um, because if you treat the kind of, you know, this algorithm, um, as something which thinks that all language is text, you know, as a literary scholar, you might have shot yourself in the foot. Um, <laughs> because, yeah, now you've got this thing that um, just pulled out place names, um, and place names could be anything really in literature. And not only does it kind of pull out this indiscriminate entity, but it also just doesn't feel very well because it's trained on um, journalistic material. Um, so I suppose, um, yeah, I suppose the projects that, um, well, I don't, I don't put a black like, qualitative word around it, but but certainly, um, yeah, critical, um, yeah, reflection of the the technologies itself, rather than just something that extracts this like metaphysical thing from the text, the truthy thing from the text. I think is helpful. <laughs> uh, I think in our point of from our point of view, uh, our project has become less and less kind of data driven the further along we've gone, and it's turned into something quite different from where we started. Uh, it's, you know, we started out thinking, well, we need a big kind of relational database. We need to be capturing uh, you know, information about place and people and event and time scales and building timelines and doing that kind of work. Uh, and the kind of place we've ended up, you know, moving away from those initial experiments that I showed, which is bringing in data sets from the Office of Living Australia and other kind of elements. Uh, we've moved much closer to working with something like that painted map by uh, Leah Umbagai and thinking, well, how can we present this in a digital space where people can interact with it a bit? Uh, but it's about using maps and geographic representations as part of kind of multimodal storytelling. And from our point of view, it's not so much a research tool and something where we're looking to answer research questions using geographic data or all these sorts of tools. It's very much about uh, how can we communicate this uh, in an engaging kind of interactive way to broad audiences of people that doesn't require someone to read a scholarly journal article or read 8,000 words of text written by a historian with footnotes through it, uh, but includes maps to give senses of place, things that people can click on and interact with, but it will also include video and photographs and 
audio recordings and other sorts of uh, kind of multimodal elements. So the, the maps are definitely in there, uh, but it's less of a data-driven atlas than the initial kind of project conception is moving much more into that kind of storytelling mode. Yeah. Um, I'll just echo um, some of the points made. Like another another good candidate for a map, digital mapping project is one where will will a visualization help you answer a question? Will it help you see patterns, um, as Emma said, that you couldn't see before? Um, and also, uh, one of the interesting things about digital humanities is how it um, problematizes or or throws up very difficult questions for the the usual IT way of doing things. Um, like, uh, how do you, well, one of the projects I worked on, the, the Enron Archive, was about um, early modern women's manuscripts, which were produced before um, printing conventions had been established. Um, and part of the point of it was that they didn't fit common repeatable standards, which is what we really need to build databases and so on. So it's, it's the way that the um, the humanities materials, or, or for example, in, in, in mapping, as you just said, uh, if you were in science, I guess you would always think of a map as a digital map as um, like the colonial fronting of Massacre's map. It, there's a picture of the world with um, points and lines and polygons on it. Um, but in humanities, we immediately think, well, um, an oral narrative can be a map as well in that it tells you what order places come in where they are in relation to each other and, and the meaning of them and, and so on. So, yeah, we, if we want to do digital mapping in humanities, we have to be able to handle uh, multimedia. Yeah. Really interesting responses, everyone. Thank you. Um, I can see that the Zoom chat is uh, kicking off. <laughs> um, and so, just quickly, I think Emma has just answered the first of the Zoom questions in the chat. So, thank you, Emma. Um, Linda Wright has, I mean, I feel free to um, speak if you would prefer, Linda, but Linda has pointed out that the, uh, just explaining some of the background to the, the Massacre Map project, the way that it grew out of her book, Tasmanian Aborigine, the history since 1803, where the cartographer completing the maps pointed out that Frontier Maps. Frontier massacres could be recorded digitally uh, and suggested an Australia wide map of frontier massacres could be possible. And so new technologies had made it kind of possible to imagine that this, this, this could be done. Uh, and then we've got a point from Steve, uh, who is able to talk about the transatlantic slave trade database, which, given Emma's uh, connections with it, I will get Ruth to switch over the audio and see if you'll agree to jump in. <laughs> If you can hear me, <laughs> if people have any questions about the slave trade database, I'm happy to answer them since I was one of the people who started it in uh, oh, 1995. <laughs> um, I'm Steve, um, just of uh, what was the first step for for you and your team in the in the sort of data collection, like just following off the conversation we've been having about software to use and, and spreadsheets and data. Um, I can imagine things would be a bit different in 95. So what was <laughs> um, the approach? Yeah, you, you, you first have to get people willing to do it. So projects are great having a lot of people, but it ends up being a couple of people doing the lion's share of the work. So you have to get some devotees who, are going to work on the project nonstop. We had two years at Harvard without teaching, which gave us some time to work on it. But our project was essentially a database project in the days before, you know, proper relational database software. So it ended up being more or less an SPSS, like an Excel spreadsheet. And the original data would have been, thinking of it like Excel, 27,000 rows times about 200 columns. And everything had to be typed out. So if you want to rely on optical character recognition, you're going to be unhappy. Uh, it's just too many errors. It's just easier to type it up from scratch. So my, my one suggestion would be find people who have a lot of time and are willing to really uh, work on it. And uh, you don't get a lot of credit for it among your employers if you're at universities. 
and optical optical character recognition technology is it's improved, but it's still not great. Uh, a lot of it, we decided to sort of do the backend database. This was sort of before you could have a lot of visual cool stuff. So, you know, in hindsight, it should have been developed as a relational database at the start, and it wasn't, because that was a bit of a different thing. I've subsequently done relational databases um, and put them on the web. But uh, I think having a, a core data set is always useful. Uh, you can add then graphic elements, maps, you know, you know, the graphics to it. And just getting the thing to function was a big deal. And getting the functionality on the web was like a prototype that showed it worked. And that enabled us to get a lot more funding. So we had sort of small funding, we showed it work, got more funding, we showed it work better and got more funding. So nothing beats having a prototype that actually works. Because if you don't have that, it works that you can show on the web, you know, it's awfully hard to convince people to give you money. And uh, we also had to have a lot of work study students in the United States because coding is very expensive. You just can't afford full-time coders compete, you know, competing with the marketplace. And in the States, they'd be international students on a work study kind of a visa where we could hire people for a lower uh, cost than a coder would cost. So cost for coding is quite extreme. And to be honest, people should learn it themselves because it's too expensive. And you should probably learn Adobe Illustrator how to do graphic arts and just do it yourself. So get on YouTube and learn how to do stuff, I, I think is a suggestion. <laughs> Thanks, Steve, for, the, uh, for that. And we've had another comment in the um, chat as well, which I won't read out because it is quite extensive, but drawing attention to some of the really interesting uh, sort of environmental applications, uh, including in Canberra, uh, including the CSIRO collection in the Butlin Archive. Um, there could be some really interesting applications for these ideas as well. Um, I will just open up. Did anyone in the room have questions? Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> um, Thanks. That was a really interesting highlight. I'm making for. I'm from um, art history, doing a PhD, but I have uh, a background in art publishing at Sydney Uni. And um, I have, my question is about infrastructure. I'm trying to build the infrastructure for publishing that's multimodal that does this kind of work, but can't do everything for everyone, of course. And my question is about. So you're describing um, this, uh, how did you get into digital humanities? But it seems to me we've now come to this point where it just is the humanities <laughs> and people are finding their way digitally because that's part of what life is, right? Um, publishing needs to do the same thing and um, academic publishing in particular is kind of tech-centric forms of knowledge and as we see with different mapping projects, we can understand things differently in various ways. So, um, I'm just wondering about these individual projects. What what a kind of future, or perhaps even things moving at the moment, might look like for a more standard approach across people who perhaps don't have the resources and the teams and um, those sorts of things. To so there's the ARDC framework, which is to build the humanities infrastructure. I'm wondering if there are exemplars or if there are. Um, I've seen a few things about, but often it's a wealthy university doing bespoke things or a good up, big up ARC project or an individual who has the do-it-yourself, I'm going to give you to do it Just kind of wondering if you've seen any movement in that kind of middle space or, or what, what you'd like to see, I guess, is the question. <laughs> I feel like girls should talk about TLC maps, yeah. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so I guess we've tried to grapple with that problem with TLC map, which is meant to make digital map mapping specifically as uh, easy for or easier for humanities researchers <clears throat> and it is meant to be infrastructure and they've got an infrastructure grant um, but we face probably similar problems to, to most people trying to do infrastructure in the humanities in in that humanities activities are often very idiosyncratic and peculiar to the project yeah. um, and that even if there are um, commonalities um, part of the point of doing a project is typically figuring out what's that in, uh, that unusual thing about it. Yeah. What is the information going to add to it? Um, and humanities people are often interested in, in marginality and things that don't fit into structures anyway. So it's very difficult. Um, but our approach is, is 
I mean, to find what those commonalities are. So one commonality is that a lot of people need a map with points on it, with information that pops up when you click a point. Um, now you could customize that and take it further and try and meet his, historians' needs or um, or um, art historians' needs or linguistics needs. Um, but then it becomes, you know, infinitely, potentially infinitely complicated. Um, so our strategy for that is that we, pro we provide a way to make it easy to get um, the simple basic starting point um, without having to employ developers and have a six month grant and, and so on very costly. Something you could just get um, a research assistant perhaps to do or do yourself. Um, and then that like often a little accomplishes a lot. Sometimes you just need that map that tells the story and, and, um, and the proof of good. concept, what Steve was saying. Yeah, yeah. proof of concept, yeah. Um, but but beyond that, if you do have a, a grant for three years or whatever and develop a, a bespoke application, um, our infrastructure is meant to be compatible with it in terms of using open standards and so on. So you can, can um, export information from your bespoke system and put that into TLC map and you can export, so your prototype from TLC map as the starting point for your project and link them both together um, in a sort of uh, mutually beneficial way in that if people come to TLC map, they'll still find your project. Um, and ultimately, if you were to build a system that did do all the things and it was based around a map, when you clicked on a point on the map, it would take you to some bespoke functionality. And that is exactly what's going to happen if you get the data from your bespoke project and put it in TLC map. You'll see TLC map, there'll be a dot you'll click on it, and it goes to your bespoke solution. It might be linking to a photograph in your archive with all the context that somebody needs to interpret or, or, or whatever it is. And you could remake that interface. We think of it the other way as well, right? So using TLC map data. I'm thinking of uh, TLC map being uh, like the prototype and proof of concept. Yeah. Thinking as a publisher, I'm like, okay, so I, you know, what pieces of that do I think of and then make for particular audiences, make it look different or have different languages or things like that. So, yeah, yeah. So that's really interesting. That's good to see that it's now, you know, expanding beyond. Um, yeah, there are also other tools that are available that I've used before for kind of prototyping of things, uh, really basic ones like story map JS, where you can put a few points on a map, add video, add photographs, navigate through a map and tell a story going from point to point, for example, which you can also use with uh, large scale images. So something like that painted map, I can create a, a sort of story map of that where you're navigating around that as if it's a map, but you don't need to geolocate it first. Uh, and bigger ones like um, ArcGIS Story Map, which uh, at least universities like ANU has a subscription to and you can log into, uh, where you can create more complex stories that include maps as well as video and photographs and text and those sort of things. Um, and I find those sort of things useful as proof of concept, not just in terms of explaining to people by showing people uh, what something might look like, but also it's something where you can very quickly do a kind of responsive version that you can take back to uh, Indigenous community, for example, and say, well, here's the initial content you gave us. Here's roughly what we want to do with it. This is what it might look like if you start to navigate through. And before you invest that time in building the kind of bespoke thing that presents this stuff in another kind of way. And hopefully um, disrupt the RTIS version that they'll be Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so we are very much running out of time, which is unfortunate. So I'm going to throw it to Romney for probably the last question. Thanks, Ron. Um, I find that when humanities people are presented with digital mapping, the question we often immediately think is, well, I've got a lot of data, but how do I choose what I map, given what it is, as Bill said, often idiosyncratic and uh, quite awkward. Um, so I'm wondering if you guys can say a few words about the initial choices for humanities researchers, and as a more precise application of that, Emma, your database seems to start with ships, let's call them slave ships. Um, was that the obvious choice? Were there other ways to do it? I can't help but wonder whether communities, for example, 
um, might be something one wanted to start with if one could, or would it be possible to do individuals? Um, there's all sorts of things one can research. I'm wondering about the balance of the, the practical and the ideal when we make these choices. Um, did you want to jump in, Emma? Um, sure. Well, the, it's a really, really good point. Um, we're starting with ships because that's uh, what we were starting with when I came on board uh, this project. Um, I guess that is in a lot of ways a logical starting point because we have a lot of information about particular ships and those voyages um, but ultimately what we're interested in is the people who were on board those ships and the places that they came from so I think um, further down the line that will involve a different type of research that isn't just going through our archives it is going uh, and doing field work and finding out where those places actually were communicating uh, uh, with, with people who are local to those places now, because so many of these uh, places are lost to history. They, they no longer appear on maps. Um, so that is something that, yeah, that, that I hope we will be able to do later to build in um, a more island-centered perspective of this, rather than like a focus on the, on the recruitment ships. Um, yeah, but in short, we, we're starting with maps because we have a, a, an extensive archive. We're starting with ships because we have an extensive archive and because uh, that was how Emma Christopher initially conceived of it. Thanks, Emma. Did any of the other panels have any final comments they wanted to share on, on that or anything else? Um, yeah, I mean, well, the, in the first phase of any project, it's probably going to be well, in IT, it's called business analysis, where you figure out what you're doing and what the underlying data structures are in, in the mess of information. Um, so sometimes it, it comes down to feasibility, like how much time do I have to spend in archives and can I get this information even if I want it? Um, and, you know, balancing that against what's really important, what's going to answer your research questions, um, and also just figuring out what even makes sense as a category um, so you've got a hundred documents. Do they do they all mention say say for colonial fronting massacres? Does it make sense to have a category for um, the type of terrain, the weapons that were used, the names of the perpetrators? These are sort of things we've had to think about. Are we going to include that or not? And partly that comes down to whether all of those hundred articles even have that information in them, such that it would make sense. Um, but another important consideration in terms of instru structuring the information is um, so kind of actually this might how much time we have so but it, it's it's kind of like a, a an inverted hierarchy so people often want to put on the map here's a place and here's all the things that I want to attach to it in like a big long narrative maybe like a story map or something here's a place now I want to attach um, in my description or, or or when someone clicks it they want to see a list of photographs and a description and some records from the database and so on um so they might start their spreadsheet by having the place name and then think how am i going to put all of that just in this one description how am i going to list images uh in a simple table format now an it person might go well that's why you need a database and not just a, a spreadsheet but you can invert that problem and do it with a spreadsheet just by looking at at the really granular level a sort of atomic level all the things that i have each of these photographs <clears throat> i can attach coordinates to every one of those photographs then they will all be geolocated every photograph will have a dot but um yeah in terms of digital mapping uh Rather than having a place and attaching a lot of the things to it, think about all the things you have and attaching coordinates to, to them, I guess is what I'm looking at. So we had better finish up there. It is two o'clock. Um, so thank you everyone for 
kind of registering and attending the, the seminar and engaging with it and asking questions. <clears throat> and there's some really interesting uh, conversations that have gone on in the chat. I'm sorry we couldn't respond to necessarily all of them, but it's clearly been a session that is hugely generative of, of ideas. Uh, and people are really enthusiastic about the projects that you have worked on and are working on. And so massive thanks to uh, Mike, Bill, Ben, and Emma, uh, as well as uh, Steve for jumping in and uh, Lindell and all the other people who have contributed to these projects uh, for your involvement in this seminar. Thanks.